Frank Critchlow arrived in London from Trinidad in 1953 and worked for British Rail as a plumber for a while. In 1956, he formed the Starlight Four Band, which appeared on the radio, on television, and in a cinema advertisement. His skills as an entrepreneur came to the fore when he realized that the new arrivals from the Caribbean and Africa had little or no social or recreational facilities where they were able to relax in a friendly and welcoming environment. Frank decided to open a cafe, the El Rio. The El Rio was opened in 1959 at 127 Westbourne Park Road. The El Rio soon became a very popular meeting place with black people in the area. Pretty soon, it became the favourite meeting place for black and white after-hour revelers, celebrities, visiting musicians and entertainers from abroad. In 1958, what is now known as the Notting Hill Riots saw between 300 to 400 strong keep Britain white mobs, many of them teddy boys, armed with iron bars, butcher's knives and weighted leather belts. They went what they called mega hunting among the Caribbean and African residents of Notting Hill and Notting Dale. Black people fought back. It took five days before it was over. In 1968, Frank went upmarket and opened the Mangrove Restaurant at 8 All Saints Road. Opening the Mangrove Restaurant was the beginning of Frank's problems. Between 1969 and 1970, the Mangrove was raided 12 times by the police. They charged Frank with petty licensing charges along with more serious crimes of supplying drugs and rioting. Frank and his friends decided to fight back against these injustices and organised a march on the 9th of August 1970. 170 people supported the march with over 700 police officers walking alongside. It was therefore no surprise that violence followed and nine people were arrested. Among the nine were Darkus Howe and Frank Critchlow, who were charged with conspiracy to riot. They became known as the Mangrove Nine. Vanessa Redgrave and Lord Gifford were among those who gave evidence at their trial. The case lasted 55 days and all nine were acquitted. In summing up, the judge said that there was racial hatred in the Metropolitan Police Force. In 1988, Frank was again in court, this time arrested and charged with drug dealing and supplying heroin. The mangrove was raided by 44 police in riot gear, led by Inspector Paul Condon, who was later knighted and became the Metropolitan Police Commissioner. Frank was never found guilty of any of these charges and so in 1992 he sued the Metropolitan Police for false imprisonment, battery and malicious prosecution. The police refused to admit fabricating evidence but paid him £50,000, a record sum at that time.
in the riots, which broke out very near where we now are in the summer of 1958. How the Caribbean community reacted to this will clearly be of great importance. They were and are very fortunate to have had a man of the caliber of Frank Critchlow as one of the leaders who would shape their response in the years that followed. Frank and others like him understood that the response of the Caribbean community must be not a simple one, but a complex one, expressed in different ways according to the different needs, just as the attitude of white people to the question of immigration was and is complex. So he not only got involved in the carnival, as did of course many others, but he made his own very distinctive contribution, about which many of you could speak better than I can, in founding the Mangrove Restaurant, Community Association, and Steel Band. He got involved in direct and sometimes radical political action, which made him highly unpopular and misunderstood in some quarters. He helped through a variety of ways to strengthen Caribbean people's sense of their own culture, their own self-worth. He even founded a retirement home for elderly Caribbeans to live out their last years in dignity. He might well ask us if anything has really profoundly changed since Frank's heyday. Sure, we have outlawed overt expression of racial intolerance, quite rightly. The police have done a great deal of soul-searching about the kind of institutional racism which compromised their attacks on people like Frank. Even the church, particularly in this part of London, now celebrates its great cultural diversity and has a number of priests, sisters, and lay workers from immigrant communities. But have our hearts really changed? Or have we just moved from fear of each other to a kind of thinly disguised, patronizing condescension about each other's cultures? Oh, how wonderful, how exotic, how beautiful, but really, how different. About a friend. This was a man who lived a life that was rich and varied, a complex task. This was a very special man, a Trinidadian, a Trinidadian migrant laborer. Came first to work on British Rail. A musician, the founding member of the Starlight Four. And there are not many here who are old enough to remember the Starlight Four, but they are some. This was a restaurateur. He knew how to put a meal together, he knew how to put a cafe or a restaurant together. This was a social entrepreneur long before they ever made up that word. Somebody who could see and understand the potential of his community and turn it into something vibrant and working and wealth creating. That was Frank. But he was more than that. He was, in all those things, an activist. And that's his message to us. It's one of activism. An activist, and above all and always, a gentleman. A gentleman. It's his smile in the memories, grace under pressure, and boy was there pressure. There was pressure. Pressure of a sort that, for many of the young here, it must be impossible to imagine what it was like. Because Frank gave us Frank gave us, Frank gave this community spaces that were our own.
Spaces where we were free. Spaces where we could be ourselves at a time in which it was not possible to be black and to be yourself. You remember those times. Frank helped us through those times. He helped us with the Rio way, way back. 127 West Wall And then he helped us with the mangrove in All Saints Road. They were our spaces. Frank created those spaces. Places where we could be free. Places where we could come together, we could Joy, we could chat, we could drink, we could eat, we could always eat. We could sing, we could hear music. They were our places. And we welcomed a whole heap of people, black, white, African, Caribbean, Asian, film stars, musicians, community folk, lawyers, plenty of lawyers. <laughs> Frank needed lawyers. There are lots of lawyers in this room now. Hands up all the lawyers, you know who you are. We know who. All there. And spaces that Frank made free. And there were people who couldn't stand that. Who couldn't stand for us to be free. They couldn't stand. And they did everything to destroy it. They did everything to take those places away from us. The very existence of those spaces was an affront to them. They were the people for whom the word Babylon was invented. The people for whom the word Babylon was a key figure in the Portobello Road and Ladbroke Grove areas for many years. He was not only an entrepreneur, but also a community activist. He was the founder of the Mangrove Community Association, which provided advice and services for the black elderly, the young, ex-offenders, and advice and support for organisations and individuals who were fighting injustices. Frank was also responsible for setting up a carnival village and the award-winning Mangrove Steel Band. Many came to learn from this charismatic figure. He maintained his humanity in the face of police aggression and a racist media. He made friends easily and won the support, not only of the downtrodden, but of influential members of society. Frank will be remembered for his tenacity, courage, and unstinting commitment to black liberation and expression. He is survived by his son, Knowlton, and daughters, Lenora, Francesca, and Amandla.